Today, we're going to be speaking with Greg Lukianoff, who's a First Amendment attorney, president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, and also co-author, along with Ricky Schlott, of the canceling of the American mind. Cancel culture undermines trust and threatens us all. But there is a solution. Greg, really great having you on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So, you know, to start with, I have to say I I'm really interested in this topic of cancel culture to the extent that I uh, believe ex it exists and speech and the issues I've seen you talk about on other shows that I reviewed kind of to prepare for our conversation. I'm really interested in this as someone who is very much on the left. Mm -hmm. I find that there are people on the left concerned about this and people on the right concerned about this. Their concern is often different. It's motivated by different things. Yeah. And and I find myself disagreeing sometimes with the nature of the concern. So can you lay this out as you see it in terms of Feel free to tell us a little bit about your political background if you sure. want, if you think it's relevant. And what's your perspective and how you have become concerned about this issue? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm a, a, a I'm liberal myself. I'm, I'm definitely left of center. You know, I definitely feel like the political spectrum has moved a little bit. And yes, uh, but still, you know, I, as someone who knows my social science, I know that my political views very much still fit left of center. Um, but I've been working on campus for 22 years now, and I worked at the ACLU of Northern California. I, I, I uh, did refugee law before that, I, and I um, and I specialized in First Amendment law. And so I was invited to be the first legal director of FIRE. And already by 2001, it was a lot easier to get in trouble for what you said on a college campus um, than I expected. And even though, and by the way, Stanford was... Uh, sometimes could be a difficult place to have a serious argument. Um, and um, uh, so I've been doing this for 22 years and things started getting a lot worse around 2014. Um, and what the big shift was that students who had always been the best constituency for freedom of speech, at least during my entire career, right. started being the ones, you know, signing petitions to get professors fired for what they said, you know, asking for new speech codes, all, all of this kind of stuff. Now, sometimes there's a little bit of like rhetorical jujitsu that happens on social media where people are like, oh, you're just blaming students. And it's like, well, if they're demanding professors get fired, then sure. But it's important to keep in mind that a lot of cases, the people who are actually leading the charge are, are administrators, but they're working with students. And whereas they couldn't find sympathetic students 10 years ago or 15 years ago, they can now find them. And when I try to convince skeptics of the of this problem, you know, I point out that of the you know 1,000 attempts to get professors uh, punished, you know that we've seen since 2014, which by the way is a very large number. If you, mm -hmm. if you, if you know your academic freedom history, you, you know you're usually talking about major incidents involving a, a handful of firings, and we're talking right. about you know o o o almost 200. I point out that one third of the punishments, you know, come from the right. They they, they come from Turning Point USA. They come from Fox News. And but my my joke, you know, I'm a, I'm an old. I'm an old First Amendment guy. I, I'm like an old liberal in the sense that I'm un unapologetic about my, my free speech stance. And it's funny because like when suddenly people start caring about the issue because they realize that a lot of liberals get in trouble. And actually, by the way, liberals get in trouble all the time, both from the left and from the right mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at, at this point. But if that suddenly makes them care about it, I'm kind of like, I really wish you'd also care when people you hate get in trouble, too. So let's talk a little bit about I mean, let me just lay out my perspective on this sure. and maybe that we could do this a bunch of different ways, but I'll lay out my perspective and you can tell me, you know, agree, disagree. What am I missing? Yeah. I am concerned with so-called even if cancel culture is not the term everybody likes, I think we all kind of know what we are alluding yeah. to when we say it. So I'll use the term cancel culture. I am concerned when cancel culture and limitations on speech uh, take place on the left. I don't like when the left uses identity politics to silence people. I was very outspoken about the absurdity of Jewish women being told by the Women's March that they aren't oppressed or intersectional enough yes. to be uh, you know, on the board. And I, I think these things are absolutely disastrous. When I see it, I call it out. When I see um, people's membership or lack thereof in a group used to say we don't need to pay attention to that, for example, if right now I'm getting David, because you're Jewish, you are inherently biased on what's happening in the Israeli Palestinian conflict. So your views and the views of Jews need to be dismissed. Well, by definition, everybody then brings some bias. Right. So I think that that's a problem. If I really am honest, I see the vast majority of this problem on the American political right. And I'll give you the areas where I see it. Yeah. Um, the 
calls for media boycotts of shows, of movies, et cetera, on the basis that they are uh, so-called promoting progressivism or they even go further than that calls for academic censorship from the right against professors who are teaching allegedly left wing stuff that they don't like attacks on corporations, boycotts on corporations because corporations take stances on issues like gun control, climate change, et cetera, social media censorship and arguing that certain views. We saw this around covid. We saw this in so many different either social media outlets should be forced to put certain views out there, even though at the end of the day, they're private corporations with terms of service. I see the majority of this yeah. on the political right. Am I missing something? Yes, the devil okay. didn't support that at all. Tell um, me. The uh, and th and this is something that is um, frustrating for me because, like, since there are threats from the right, it's very quick for people, you know, particularly on my side of the fence, to to point to the threats that are real on the right, and many of which my organization Fire has taken to court. Okay. Uh, and and one, by the way, um, that uh, that allows us to kind of like focus on on that problem and not look at the problem on our own side. But I I will say without equivocation, the problem is worse on the left. Okay. Um, Give me the and, data. So the, so the data. Um, now, if you want, like, if people are looking for reasons to 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 be concerned about a liberalism on the right. Mm -hmm. Those professor numbers are the ones they should be looking at okay. um, because th those are coming from, like I said, Turning Point USA, Fox News, et cetera. And that, and one third of professors, that's a, that's a lot of the punishments going on um, on campus. That, that That's hundreds of professors uh, being being punished. And that's something that we could really use more help on. I would also like to convince your your, your listeners to help the people who are neither right or left, because there's about eight, eight or nine percent of those, you know, are neither right or left. And then 60 mm percent -hmm. are actually, you know, from the left. So certainly the problem on campus. Uh, is is much more on the left uh, than the right. When it comes to legislatures, the the one law that has been passed that was a threat to curriculum um, in higher ed, one that was clearly unconstitutional, was the Stop Woke Act. And the Stop Woke Act is something we went right into court um, as soon as we could find a plaintiff challenge and won, by the way. So right mm -hmm. now it's actually been De uh, defeated. They're trying a stop woke too, which will also try again. You know, and I think it's going to be laughed out of court, just like the last one. But there, there has been one, and it's been defeated. So I, I think that there's too many convenient ways for to 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 keep the left from doing some really valuable self-reflection on some of this stuff. And I think we're so calcified in our current culture war. And when, and the funny thing is, when you were talking about boycotts and you were talking about all, all the corporate stuff, I felt like I, I was like I thought I was listening to one of the one of my Fox News interviewers be, be, mm. because it was like they always talk about the left always doing this, you know. And so so it's it's one of those things where it's like yes, there are very real threats from the right and we fight them, but uh, but at the same time, I I don't want people to use that as a way of saying like there's not an, a serious a liberals problem on the left. And and honestly, like I said, it's worse um, by all the data that we're, that we're able to see when it comes to attitudes about freedom of speech, the polling, um, the, the, the uh, right now, particularly among millennials, uh, left leaning millennials, the, the numbers are bad. Um, and that generally people on the right have become more pro free speech. Of course, to be clear, that's always sort of like a matter of political convenience for a lot of people, unfortunately. If they think they're the ones who are more likely to get censored, they tend to be more pre uh, pro free speech. And if you think you're more likely to be the, the people making those calls, you tend to be more pro censorship. So I think there's a bunch of stuff there where the devil really is in the details. I mean, first of all, it sounds like what you're saying is the case that this is and we don't ne just have to talk about where it's worse. It'd be we'll get to solutions in a moment, but sure, at sure. least to keep framing this, it sounds like you're saying the data that proves this is more of a problem on the left than the right is that when we look at attempted firings of professors, a third of them are from the right, 10 percent of them are from the middle and the other 57 percent, the other 50 depending on the year you said eight or nine. Yeah. And so basically and then 57 to 60 percent is from the left. So yes. from all the categories I mentioned, you're looking just at the academic thing and saying by a 60 40 margin, it's more a problem on the left. That's oh, but, not the oh, but, strongest oh, but, case. Oh, oh, but David, it's yeah. worse than that. OK, the people actually doing the firing in those third of cases are almost always themselves left leading. Um, the the pressure comes from outside, and because yeah. universities have become so cowardly and bad on freedom of speech, okay. and since it's super majority of administrators are actually in charge, so th th this does not com even those cases do not completely 
um, ab absolve the left. Um, and when it comes to professors, one of the reasons why we have this data is because um, it's what's knowable currently. Like we're actually looking into um, the, the different attacks on students. When we started look initially looking um, into students, when it was a question of viewpoint, yeah, you were a ton more more likely to get in trouble uh, for something uh, if you angered the left than if you angered the right, which is not surprising given the people who actually enforce the rules at universities are, and this is uncontroversial research at this point, um, are super majority left and same thing, same thing with professors. So if there's a free speech problem on college campuses, it is a left problem. Okay. Um, so from the data you gave me, it is somewhat more of a left problem than a right problem. I concede the audience can they've heard your side of it. They can look it up. Let, let's sure. put the campus piece aside for a second. Yeah. There are entire movements that are forms of cancel culture or speech suppression that are almost exclusively coming from the right. The mm -hmm. entire social media company, covid vaccine, that entire thing was led almost exclusively by the right saying it is wrong for YouTube to enforce terms of service and remove anti-vax content, even though it is YouTube's right as a corporation to say we have terms of service as long as we're not saying, hey, black people aren't allowed to post or whatever. What YouTube was doing was just enforcing terms of service. You had right wingers saying Twitter should not be allowed to remove our anti-vax information. To me, these are all forms of attempting to limit the speech of these private platforms to say, hey, we have terms of service and we're not doing anything illegal. We can decide what's allowed on our platform. Yeah, uh, th this is very interesting. I've watched this actually happen on the left. The um, the, the increasing sort of favoritism for powerful corporations to make these decisions themselves. Is that's too is, easy it, it, a way to write it off, though. I don't well, I don't think that that's what it is. I think it's simply saying Republicans aren't holding themselves to their own standards with this stuff. And neither neither are Democrats dead like in, Cal in California, like the, the ex lost it, uh, um, launched a, a lawsuit uh, uh, um, with, due to social media regulations they have in California that are yeah. that are incredibly onerous and actually pressure them to, you know, uh, clamp down on hate speech. So th so I, I kind of want to introduce Florida, Texas to California uh, mm. to, to actually point out that both sides are actually trying to make social media do their bidding. They just have different ideas of what their bidding is. And okay. one thing I really want to caution you on yeah. is that misinformation, disinformation is a uh, exception to freedom of speech so wide it, it, give, it, it, it puts in the hands of power, limitless power to, to censor people they, they, they dislike. And I think that the uh, I think that a lot of what actually, and we talk about, you know, some of the um, some of the cancel culture cases that came out of COVID, for example, sure. and a lot of those cases are people who weren't, by the way, on the right, uh, but who ended up being right about things like school closures, like losing their careers, because they were like, you know, like Jennifer Say at, at, at Levi's Jeans, her original point you know, was that this is going to hurt disadvantaged kids the most closing the schools um, and it's going to hurt students for, for years to come. And she was forced out of Levi's and she was right. Um, and basically, like, there, there's there's large agreement that essentially the lockdowns were harmful to kids. Last thing from the categories you mentioned was on attitudes towards yeah. speech. It is true that when you look at Pew, Cato, Gallup and a couple of others I looked at, by depends which poll between an eight and 20 point margin, those who identify as being on the right are more likely to be supportive of free speech in more cases than those on the left. Do we agree on the numbers depending on the poll, eight to 20 percentage points? Is that fair? Uh, depending on the poll, depending uh, on the yeah. poll, just so we're yeah. kind of in agreement is the degree to which this is the case. Yeah, my well, so not, I'm not claiming it's a massive gap. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. There's a gap. There's a gap. Yeah, sure. there's a gap. I think my concern is that very often and Scott Galloway actually recently had a really good commentary on this. Very often, some of the people who are pushing free speech for free speech's sake are just wanting to be able to say racist and xenophobic things with no consequences, and they're <laughs> entitled to do it. Listen, I, I respect that they're completely yeah. entitled to do it. I am not hugely uh, I don't find it the most admirable cause 
to be focused on free speech for free speech's sake when David, what you really want to do is say horrible things with no consequences, David, even if it's David, the right I'm, to do I'm, it. I'm, I'm laughing right now because Please. I, I, and I respect you to be clear, okay. but but I hear these arguments so often it's it's, it's hard for me to take them all that seriously because right, well, right it, now right, okay. right now what's happening with regards to pro-Palestinian speech and pro uh, on, on campus is people are saying, well, this is consequence culture, guys. These, the, the students that we're going after, the 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 um uh, the blacklist that we're creating of pro Hamas, pro pro Palestinian speech, that's just consequence culture. And meanwhile, what's actually happened because it, it's so difficult, it, like basically like. My side cannot admit that it's wrong on anything. It feels like, and and, and it drives me literally nuts sometimes. I, I admit but, it all the time. You know, I mean. Yeah. Oh, but 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 let's say so. So for example, kind of like the blacklists, you know, yeah. um, against people who said pro Hamas speech. Yeah. For for various jobs, um, they uh, the the the. The first thing that people do on, on Twitter and on social media is like, well, the free speech advocates, the cancel culture people are silent on this. And meanwhile, I'd already talked about it a million times. It's like I've been mm. on national TV talking about I don't like blacklists. This is um, th that we should that we should not doing this is this is cancel culture, but not actually saying maybe actually the sort of um, like quick dismissal of of cancel culture as being consequence culture wasn't that great of an idea. Because to me, all saying that something is consequence culture is is usually that they haven't looked into the particular cases in many cases, because you can't really look at the cases that we have in the book and say, these are all justified. Um, and that, as, that that essentially it's just, it's a pat way of trying not to engage as much. That's why I don't like, the, can't, I, I feel like the, it, 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 it basically, it literally begs the question. And like in the, in the sense that in the actual original sense of that term, it assumes yes. the premise to be true. I, I guess I'm just not really sure are when it comes to what I'm pointing out, which is just on a completely factual basis, the gap in terms of support for free speech between left and right is relatively modest at you as you admit. And there is a contingent of the right that when asked the question, do you support free speech? They don't want consequences socially nor from an employment standpoint of saying horrible things about either racial minorities or sexual orientation minorities or whatever. And I don't find I'm talking only about that contingent. I'm with yeah. you on 90 percent of this. That contingent, I don't find a particularly a particularly admirable reason to say I'm for free speech. It's not super interesting to me. Yeah, I, I think that's that's too easy of an out, because like when, okay. when, when, you, when you look at the cases that we talk about in the book, you know, a lot of cases, these are things where you have a hard time even figuring out how someone was offended by it in the first place. OK, I don't deny that. I, th yeah. That's fine. And, and as far as those those examples go, I think they should be looked at. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. Sure. What sorts of solutions are the types of things that you believe would be most effective? I think we have a I think we have an opportunity to figure out cheaper, more rigorous ways to do a lot of education. Um, mm. I, I think that right now, I think the extent to which um, and we focus a lot about this in the final couple chapters about how much um, and I really want to appeal to you know, make sure that the people on the left get this message. Yep. That um, uh that the there's a book by Evan Mandry called Poison Ivy that I think everyone should read. And it talks about how much elite colleges uh, in particular recreate class privilege that essentially like the for every, you know, one you know a, a kid who grew up working class like me who goes to Stanford, you know, thousand rich kids, you know, uh, get, get to stay in the upper classes. And I think that there uh, that I think there's sometimes a reflexive defense of higher education without actually thinking about how we could do something that would be more equitable, that would be mm -hmm. less expensive, that would be something that you could actually do without going into debt. Um, and we're trusting in these mega corporations um, far, far more than we should. So I think that some of the some of the different ways. You know, um, I think even uh, what, uh, what's his name, Sal Khan, you know, uh, from Khan Academy is even yeah. working on uh, on a way to, you know, show that you're an autodidact, you know, uh, 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 in, um, uh, and get, you know, uh, uh, get a degree that way. So I think that actually we need it's a time where we need a lot of experimentation for cheaper, better solutions. So is that now that's that's interesting when it comes specifically to the issue of education. But what, mm -hmm. am, what about more broadly to the cultural attitudes, to the ways in which a lot of these instances of speech being adjudicated in different ways. What are is there a framework to solve the problem as you've identified not, it? Not, not, not a single one, which is one yeah. of the reason why I don't love the subtitle, because it makes it sounds like I think there's a solution. I, right. I think that there are many things we could be doing to make it better. But the most fundamental one, honestly, is 
a little bit of the a little bit of the just just the idea that everyone's entitled to their opinion, even if you think it's repugnant, um, would be something that I, I wish we had that as a societal cliche that we took seriously still, because it doesn't feel like we're doing that way. And and we do call that out by the way on the right and the left, basically being kind of like, well, if that's your opinion, then I'm better off not knowing it. It's like. Honestly, if that's someone's opinion, you're, it's even if it's horrifying, it, it's usually better to know it than not. Yeah, I mean, my approach with the platforming of disgusting people over the last however many years on the show has been, I want to know what their opinion is, and then I want to evaluate whether it's getting enough attention to be worthy of refuting it versus ignoring it. And it's just yeah. a choice that we can make as individuals. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think that's entirely fair. Like, like the, the you know, the, the, the way I talk about it, the, my, my overall theory on freedom of speech is something I call the pure informational theory of free speech. And as I always say, it's like, listen, um, and it's one of the reasons why I caution people against going too hard on misinformation, disinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, lizard people who live under the Denver airport do not control the world. But if your uncle, girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, thinks they do, that is incredibly valuable information. And if a large part of society thinks they right. do, you better be able to study it. And, and I, I'm here, I'm thinking in part of, of th things like QAnon, obviously not true, um, but worth knowing how many people believe this stuff. Oh, man. Yeah. 100 percent, 100 percent. The book is the canceling of the American mind. Cancel culture undermines trust and threatens us all. But there is a solution, even though it's not a solution, as Greg, <laughs> as Greg pointed out, it's, it's, many. It's, a, it's a bunch. We've been speaking with Greg Lukianoff, First Amendment attorney and co-author of the book. Really appreciate your time and insights today. Thank you, David. That was fun.